Comparison of Scales to Otoliths for Age Determination of American Shad from the Connecticut River. A presentation by Frank Barris, Southern Connecticut State University. In this presentation, I will be examining a research problem concerning American Shad in the Connecticut River. I will present working and alternate hypotheses with expected outcomes. I'll give a brief overview of several acquisition and aging methods required for this project and the statistical tests that will be used to assess findings. I'll give a realistic assessment of obstacles to completion. Finally, I'll examine current and future applications of the data. As discussed in my last presentation, American shad are anadromous fish native to the Atlantic coast of North America. Shad spend most of their lives in marine habitats and return to freshwater to spawn around the age of four or five. Migrating and juvenile shad during and after spring spawning runs are an important component of Connecticut River ecology. Once prominent, shad landings have been in decline over the past 15 years or so, subsequently decreasing the economic and cultural importance of the fishery. The declines are even more drastic if you compare them to the numbers since the 50s and 60s. The decreases in landings as seen on the last slide have been attributed to a number of causes. In my last presentation, I described upstream and downstream passage rates and limitations due to anthropogenic effects for adults and juveniles migrating on the Connecticut River. Along with heightened predation, this places a great strain on critical juvenile stages such as time and success of first feeding, which ultimately determines year class strength for the species. As a result, several questions are available for research to determine just how much the population structure is affected annually. Age structure is very important. If mostly young fish are being caught, fewer fish are left to grow old and reproduce over the next few years, leading to population decline. However, if older fish are caught too, more will be left to grow older and reproduce. Age structure can assist in population estimates, as well as setting commercial and recreational creel and size limits for fisheries. The best way to address any issue is through a well-informed fisheries management plan, of which relevant research topics and precise data is essential. I have designed a research project in order to ensure the most accurate age structure data for shad in the Connecticut River. I will collect and compare results from traditional scale-based methods to otolith-based methods for aging and assessing American shad populations in the Connecticut River. Results will be examined between both methods to assess the validity and applications of each, as well as compared to previous year's data. Research designs should be applicable to similar anadromous species when possible, as an added benefit. Overall, this project aims to compile accurate, precise data for better informed fisheries management plans and hopefully contribute to the success of the species in the future. Previous studies of known aged fish have found that scale-derived ages tend to underestimate shad around age 7, slightly after the critical point of sexual maturity. Connecticut's shad data has historically been obtained through the use of scales, and the State Marine Fisheries Division houses a database of scale-aged fish that dates back to the early 1980s. More recently, otoliths have been shown to be much more accurate. However, there are many advantages to using scales, and I hope to be able to justify continued use. After thoroughly examining previous studies, there is still potential for other outcomes. Few differences may be found between the two structures. This is definitely possible if the population age structure is stretched too thin and not many older fish remain. Otoliths may be the only one reliable aging method, and use of scales should be discouraged. Hopefully this is not the case. You'll see the benefits of scale aging later. While unlikely, it may be possible that neither method produces reliable results, and other aging methods such as using vertebrae or opercula should be explored. So how will this project work? First of all, we're going to need some fish. So how do we get them? That's easy. We catch them. Well, not quite like that. Gill nets are large walls of nylon netting that can be hung at the desired depth in the water column, which will probably be about 7 meters at most. 
Gill nets can be targeted for specific species through mess size, which reduces bycatch. For American Chad, it will be about 14 centimeters when stretched. The nets allow only the heads of the fish to fit through. When they try to back out, their gills and operculum become entangled. A sufficient sample size is essential to this project. Between 200 and 500 fish should be enough to gather an accurate representation of the river spawning population. All fish must be numbered, measured, weighed, and sexed carefully to avoid any mix-ups as we want to compare each structure for the same fish. So now we can start collecting aging structures. Fish are aged through methods very similar to counting tree rings. As growth lessens during certain seasons, characteristic bands appear on hard structures. Methods for taking fish are well defined by species to ensure consistency. About 10 to 20 scales are taken from each fish. Mucus and loose scales are scraped from the spot where scales are to be removed. This cleans the scales a little and makes processing easier. Here's a picture of a deep technician removing scales from a walleye. Scales are removed with a very sharp knife blade and inserted into a corresponding envelope to be cleaned and processed later and so they don't get mixed up. Shad scales are always collected from the mid-lateral area on the left side of the fish posterior to the pectoral fin base as seen in the diagram. It is important to note that scales are the only non-lethal way to age the species. For other species such as sturgeon, fin rays can be used. Otolith extraction is a bit more complicated and requires sacrifice of the fish. Using a scalpel or knife, the top part of the head is excised from the back of the skull, slicing forward through a point just above the eyes. This exposes the brain cavity. Using forceps, the brain matter is removed using a forward scooping motion. The otic membranes, one on each side, are extracted with fine-tipped forceps. The otoliths are usually found within the sotic membrane, but occasionally remain in the bony case where the membrane was removed. In that case, a stream of water from a squirt bottle can be used to dislodge them. Otoliths are rinsed with water and stored dry in labeled microcentrifuge tubes. Obviously, great care is needed when dealing with such small structures. Now that we have our scales and otoliths, they need to be aged. All structures must be aged multiple times by multiple readers. American Shad age data has traditionally been taken using Kading's 1953 scale aging technique, in which the annuli, as seen here, were taken into account as well as the transverse grooves. While this method was widely used for over 50 years, doubts about the validation study techniques were addressed, and current methods no longer take transverse grooves into account. Larger scales tend to have more grooves regardless of age, sex, or location, possibly allowing for scale flexibility. Scale aging, scale aging is as much of an art as it is a science, and it is not always as easy as this image on the right may make it seem. Several scales must be examined from each fish. The scales are first cleaned in a 5% pancreatine solution to remove tissue and mucus in a high-frequency sonic wave jewelry cleaner. Scales are viewed using transmitted light with image processing software and a camera through a microfiche reader, slide projector, or dissection scope. Lighting must be adjusted so annuli can be viewed crossing over the baseline. Annuli appear as continuous strong bands that cross the transverse grooves, continue past the baseline, and move from the center outward. The first dark band is usually the freshwater zone. The first annulus is frequently weak and doesn't always follow the annulus criteria. The edge is counted as the last annulus if the fish is captured in spring during the time of annulus formation. Occasionally, false annuli will be present. These do not cross over the baseline, cannot be followed throughout the scale, or cannot be seen on every scale. On older fish, annuli will become crowded together at the edge of the scale, but will separate beneath the baseline. Spawning marks are unique to scales only. Now that you've had a crash course in scale aging, try to determine the age of this fish. 
Start at the freshwater mark and count outward. Remember the rules and no cheating. This will be on the test. You have 10 seconds. Had enough? The freshwater zone is usually well defined. The first annulus is faint, while the rest are somewhat clearer and clustered at the edge. Remember that an annulus has to follow continuously through the baseline, which can be tricky. The outer edge is counted as the final year, as fish caught during spring migration are in the process of forming annuli. If you guessed six, great job. If you had seven, you were probably thrown off by the false annulus here. Keep studying. Scale aging definitely takes practice. Reading otoliths is relatively easier. Otoliths are immersed sulcus side down in mineral oil on a back black background and viewed under a stereo microscope with reflected light. Annuli are defined as continuous, hyaline, or dark bands with no breaks. Just as in scales, false annuli typically are not continuous, appear outside of expected areas, lack a defined edge, or connect with true annuli. Annuli are counted from the focus outward along the pararostrum. Now it's your turn. This one will be a lot easier, right? Start from the innermost annulus. 10 seconds, go. You probably noticed that annuli were somewhat easier to determine in an otolith than in a scale. The dark bands are easily discernible, but some bias will remain depending on the reader. Just as in scales, the outer edge here is counted as the last annulus. You can see some false annuli here marked in red. And this fish was six years old. As you just experienced yourself, choosing a method of aging fish is not as simple as it first seems. Aging errors have occasionally resulted in catastrophic mismanagement of species. This, was, this happened in the case of the orange ruffy off the coast of New Zealand. Due to improper aging techniques, the species was presumed to live for 20 to 30 years and fished intensively. Later, more effective methods determined the species experienced a very slow growth rate and could live over 100 years, but it had already been exploited to the brink of population collapse. There are pros and cons to using each method for shad, and this is why I'm hoping to be able to justify the continued use of scales. Scales are easier to obtain. A good day of catching can yield plenty of samples with much less effort required. Historical data for shad in the Connecticut River has always been scale based. While new technologies generally cause older ones to gradually fade out, time is not always an affordable luxury when a species is in decline. Scales result in minimal harm compared to other methods. It does not require killing the fish and scales can also regenerate. However, as you saw, scales are very difficult to read and interpret. This can be exacerbated by reader bias, which is why it's important for multiple readers to process each sample multiple times. Scales have widely been shown to under overestimate young fish and underestimate older fish. Kading's traditional transverse groove method was discredited in 2005, which left less faith in scale-based derivations. For otoliths, they have been shown to provide increased accuracy when results are compared to known age oxytetracycline marked and recaptured fish. They are easier to read as annuli are generally more well defined. Also, the methods for American Shad have been validated. However, otoliths require sacrifice of the fish. Inherently, this can cause problems, especially with some outside groups. This also lends to increased efforts and cost. 
the extraction and preparation time is much greater than what's required for scales. Finally, an annual database of otolith aged fish from the Connecticut River does not yet exist. In order to assess data, a few simple statistical methods will be applied. The first of which is percent agreement. This is basically how similar each reading is to, to others. Percent agreement will be assessed in several ways, between multiple blind readings of each structure for each reader. Additionally, percent agreement will be examined for ages derived from both structures and then compared reciprocally. As seen in Table 2 here, ages derived from scales and otoliths in this study were only the same about 50% of the time. Most readings were within a year of each other, and almost all readings were within three years of each other. Additional Wilcox and rank sum tests between readings from otoliths and those from scales can assess over and underestimation, which has previously been cited as an issue when aging older fish. The other statistical method that I'll use in this study is the coefficient of variation. Determination of a CV when aging fish was defined as a key measure in a paper from Campana in 2001 regarding accuracy, precision, and quality control in fish age determination. Coefficients of variation are widely used in statistically sound measures of aging precision in several ways that will be assessed in this study. Where percent agreement measured the quality of determination between readers, the CV will assess precision of results between readers for each structure among results for a randomly assigned subsample of 100 fish, and between results for otoliths and results for scales for each reader. The equation looks complicated, but it's really quite simple. Xij is the I age estimate of the J fish. Xj is the average age estimate of the J fish. And R is the number of times that the fish was aged. Simply put, a lower CV means better precision and more reliable aging results. If you look at age 6 in the graph on the right here, readers were more inclined to disagree on scale ages than they were with otolith ages. Since this study will contain rather large data sets, all these analyses will be done through our programming. The feasibility of this project is dependent upon several factors. Costs will be low and mostly concern tools, as I have already gathered most of the necessary reading equipment at Southern with the help of Dr. Burian. Sample size remains a problem. I will not know exactly how many fish I can acquire until the Connecticut River flow allows for collection. This is an uneasy area as flow rates have been greatly affected by weather events both this winter and recently. Background information and training for this project has already been in progress over the last six months and is continually updated. The skills required to interpret results will take some time, but that should be addressed with practice after multiple readings. With equipment comes software. Luckily, I was able to find a 5, meg 5 megapixel USB C-mount microscope camera with software that will allow for image manipulation and measurements. Finally, a lot of time and effort will be required for successful completion. Only after that will I be able to determine the real application of the results. I have come up with a unique and fun way to increase sample size. Every year, the annual Shad Derby is held in Windsor, Connecticut. I have been in contact with the promoters of the fishing competition, and I'm aiming to set up a booth at the weigh-in. From there, I can take my measurements, scales, and odorless samples. I think this is a great way to link public interaction with studies on the species. Even if it's just a few more fish, I'll increase my sample size and I'll get to learn and interact with the real experts. In summary, this project will aim to have several practical applications. First, scale-aged fish will allow for data consistent with previous years. And regardless of anything else, the Connecticut Deep Marine Fisheries Division will receive accurate aging estimates for 2015. Once I have my data, I'm hoping to find ways to optimize the process to be more efficient and precise. This could be very beneficial and contribute to stock recovery if different ways to interpret scale data in regards to otolith data can be found. In any case, 
an otolith based database will be established to be continued annually. With the recent rise in the call for citizen science, public interaction and engagement is always a good step. Personally, I'll benefit from expert interaction and discussion of methods or ideas. Finally, I'll produce a submission for peer-reviewed journals, such as those offered by the American Fishery Society, Canadian Journal of Fisheries, or North American Journal of Fisheries Management. Thank you for your critiques of my last presentation. I tried to focus more on research methods and questions rather than background in this presentation. If you have any questions, suggestions, or would like to be involved in the study, such as assisting at the Shad Derby or being trained to read structures, please feel free to contact me at the email address listed. No, I really mean it. I could use some help. Please contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. Thanks for watching.